turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 as we continue our study of 1 Peter uh, systematically going through verse by verse and seeing really the truths that are in this section. And this section, as I said last week, is really so rich, but it has a, just a few short words that Peter is able to say so much to us. And um, also, if you have your Bibles and would like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you kind of hold your place there. We'll be going back and forth. As 1 Corinthians 12 is really a parallel passage to 1 Peter 4. And we can kind of look back and forth and kind of get some links and more things from the text. I believe that will be beneficial to us. But before we dive into our passage this morning, let's pray and ask that the Lord would help us and minister to our hearts. Dearly, Father, as we come before you again, Lord, thank you for the words that we were able to sing about who you are. Lord, it is our heart's goal and our heart's mission and our heart's desire to worship you and to become more like you. And so, Lord, as we come to your word and the text that is before us today, we, use, we ask that you would use it to be beneficial to our souls and our hearts so that we might become more like you in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would bless our time and make much of the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So we've been discussing this rich, short passage that Peter's been discussing, and it's really talking about how our conducts in the times that we might be suffering, the times in which we live, uh, and, and we're going through this time in which we live in this world which is not our home. Uh, Peter's addressed this congregation or this group of people as the elect exiles or strangers or sojourners in this world, and so he has a message to them that he wants to give to them in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is at hand, or the end of all things is near. In other words, it's imminent. It's close at hand. And so this is not to alert them or to really to get them to act sporadically or to, to get them to fly off the handle or anything like that. He's, he's telling them that for their purpose, or for the purpose of giving them to understand and how you should live if the end time is near, or the end of, of all things is at hand. So Peter basically gives us a simple instructions that will help us live for Christ when the battles of life come our way. And the battles of life are always uh, either at our front door or coming out of a battle, they're always around the, the believer. And so we said that what we saw last week was the incentive, the incentive to live for Jesus Christ is to know or remember that His return is at hand. So we live for Christ, we live uh, becoming like Christ, because we know that His return is imminent, it's at hand, it's close by, and His return could happen at any moment. Well then we also looked at the instructions. Peter then says, because His return is at hand, here's how you should live. And he gives us instructions on how to do that. First we saw that there's a personal holiness, remember this? Our personal holiness is... Uh, a, a vertical relationship with the Lord. And so he says in verse 7, in 7b really, Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. We're not to be frazzled, we're not to be uh, unhinged by the news that the end of, of time is at hand. In other words, uh, we're not to become, you know, just fly off the handle of that news, but be sober-minded and be self-controlled. Well, how do we do that? By aligning our thoughts with what the scriptures have to say. By becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, in, in doing that, you know, we become more in communion or fellowship with God. So the more I read the word of God, the more I see what it has to say to me, the more I pray prayers back to God, the more I commune with Him. And so if you ever see somebody who says, well, uh, I, I'm not really hearing from God, I'm not really in communion, uh, communion with God, I'm not in fellowship with God. Well, let me just ask you this. When's the last time that you had a, a thoughts about God? When did you think God thoughts? When have you uh, filled your mind with the things of God? When have you poured yourself into reading the Word of God and say, well, I've not done that in quite some time. Well, maybe that's why you haven't heard from God because there's not going to be a communion with God without fellowship with God. And so Peter says, listen, be self-controlled, be sober-minded, think the things of God, think God thoughts for the sake of your prayers or for the purpose of your prayers. So that they, will, they uh, won't be unhinged, but they will be effectual prayers by thinking, and fervent prayers by thinking on the things of God. So there's a personal holiness in which we're to seek after if we're going to uh, have our prayers heard. But then also we saw that there's, we are to love one another. Verse 8 says this, 
the command that Peter gives us above all, that, that's a matter of first importance, right? So if I come in here and we're going to lay out a plan, the first thing I'm going to start with is saying, okay, here's what matters the most, right? And so Peter says, here's what matters the most. Here, above all, above anything, keep loving one another earnestly or fervently, since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that is not to say that we look the other way when somebody is in open, open willful defiance to the, to the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going, there's other passages and other texts that, that handle that. But we as believers, uh, like Paul says, we're incarcerated within this flesh. That means that we're going to continue to mess up from time to time. We don't desire that. We don't want that. But in the nature that we are believe, humans, we're going to mess up. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. So what he's saying here is don't go around every time someone trips up saying, ha, 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 I see what you did there. I see what you're doing. No, we're not to berate, to berate them or, or uh, to condemn them constantly, but to love them as if we don't even see their sin. Okay, so he says, and that, that's a horizontal relationship. Number one, we have a vertical relationship, our personal holiness to God. But then we have a horizontal relationship, and that's with other people. So it's love God and love others. We've seen this other places in Scripture, right? And John says, love God. If you forget everything else, remember this. Love God and love others. And Peter comes along and Paul would come along and say the same thing as well. And then he continues on with the thought in verse 9. But with the, with the idea that we are to extend this love to Christians who we don't even know. So it's, it's one thing to love and to serve uh, each other, right? At Cedar Mountain Baptist Church. But then it's another thing to love complete strangers who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know them. I don't know where they came from. I don't know if they even like sweet tea or not. I don't know anything about them. I don't know if they put salt on their watermelon, right, or any of that kind of stuff. And I don't know that I can love them. Well, remember the, the, the situation in the early church when they would travel around and, and they would come from town to town. They could not stay at the hotels or the motels, the inns, right? Because they were so morally corrupt, and there was so much debauchery going on within the inns that Christians would not defile themselves by going in. So they would they would count on other believers in different cities to welcome them into their homes. And so that's what he says here in verse nine: Show hospitality to, to one another without grumbling. So when when you see a believer come into the city and they recognize you as believers, as someone who is worshiping, going into the temple, having fellowship with other believers, and they come up to you and say, hey, can me and my 12 kids and my wife come and stay at your house? And you say, yes, right? You don't do that grudgingly, right? You say, come on in, and what I have is yours. And when you leave, I'm going to set you up so where you have bread and food and water for the trip out. That's how we should treat other Christians, not grudgingly, not, not uh, quarreling with them, but welcoming, being hospitality and welcoming to them. So we're to do this without uh, grudging. Uh, so then, we, I kind of jumped ahead of myself last week, and I said I labeled this part service where we talked about the stranger. But I got to back up and say I didn't quite get to my outline last week as I like. So today we're going to see service, the beginning of the service as we follow up with this idea that Peter's talking about. This is the third element in Peter's instructions. The first element was personal holiness. The second element is, is love one another, even strangers. And here's the third element in its service. And this is where we're going to be for today. Verse 10. Verse 10 and 11, really. But let me read verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. So we are to be serving one another. This this. Christian life calls us to an act of service, but the question is, how do we serve? To serve here, the word serve here means to really to wait on people, like when you go to a restaurant, you have a waiter or a waitress, someone who serves you. Really, it could go beyond that to the busboy, one who comes around and cleans up afterwards. And sometimes we've been in some restaurants, we say, what in the world is that rack? And the busboy's slinging glasses in there, and he's kind of just raking it all in there, gets up, and you're like, wow, that was... I don't know if that was really certain or if he's mad at somebody or what's going on there, but that's kind of what the idea here is to serve. So we are to serve one another, and if we're going to serve one another, we need to have tools, right? We need to have resources in which we are to serve one another. Let me give you an example of this. 
If I were to announce next Saturday that here at the church we're going to have a men's work day, and the purpose of that men's work day is to cut up firewood for some of our senior saints that, that still keep with wood and need some wood supplied uh, for this coming winter. And I said, all right, guys, come on out. Let's, let's get to busy. Let's get to work. Let's get busy next Saturday at 10 o'clock. And really, that's all we need to say. And the guys start showing up. But no, no, the guys show up, but they don't bring any axes. They don't bring any goat devils. They don't bring any uh, splitters. They don't bring any malls. They don't bring any uh, uh, protective equipment. They don't bring anything. No, nothing to split the firewood up, right? In other words, they don't show up with the tools necessary to accomplish the service to one another, right? That's not doing any good. They're, they're, so what Peter is saying is, you have been given the tools, you have been given the resources in which you are to serve one another with. Okay? So Peter says in verse 10, the tools that you need are called gifts. They're, they're, the resources in which you, that God has given you are called gifts. And so let's unpack what he means here in these <coughs> verses by telling us that we've all received a gift and use it to serve one another. So the first thing that I want us to see here is the extent of the gifts. Number one, the extent of the gifts. So notice that he says here in verse 10, each has received a gift. And when he means each, he's talking about each believer. Each Christian has received a special gift. You have a gift. I have a gift. All God's people has a gift, right? We all have a gift. Every true believer has received a gift. This is the extent. As you have turned to 1 Corinthians 12, let's flip over to 1 Corinthians 12 for just a few moments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Peter is also talking about these gifts, these, these spiritual gifts, these special gifts. And let's begin reading in verse 1 here, and just kind of notice some things about what uh, Peter has to say here. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, so... He's obviously talking about the gifts and, and what's going on here about them. Brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. So the opposite of that is true also, right? I want you to be informed. I don't want you to be not informed. I want to inform you about some things. Then verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Then verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Here's the point that Peter wants us to see. First he wants us to see this. That there are many members in the body of Christ. And so he says, here's a way, an analogy, in which I want to show that to you. Just as the body has legs, the human body, the physical body, your physical body, has legs, has eyes, has ears, has, no, has a nose, has fingers, and it's still, there's many members that make up your physical body. Okay? Fingers, arms, hands, that makes up the one body. So it is with the Lord Jesus Christ in the church. The church is called the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's made up of what? Many members, many believers, many Christians. And so this is what Peter's wanting us to see here. There are many members of the body of Christ. Now, notice back in verse 11, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's two parts to the giving of this gift. Number one, it's universal. You see what he says there? It's to all. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit. And it's also individual or individualistic. Who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So let me give you an analogy, kind of an example to help us think about this. And it's a good analogy that you probably want to come true. What if I were to say that I'm going to give the church... Everybody in here, a brand new vehicle, all right? And you're like, all right, that's good. I like this now. I like where this is going. So everybody that's in here today, everybody that's a member of Secret Mountain Baptist Church gets a vehicle, gets a brand new vehicle. So you could ask the question, who gave you the vehicle? Who, uh, who did I give the vehicle to? The church, right? I gave a vehicle to the church. 
to each one of the church members, I gave a vehicle. But then individually, I gave each and every one of you a different type of vehicle, right? To some of you, I gave a, a small car, right? To some, uh, a mid-sized car. To some, a uh, larger car. To some, a van. To some, uh, SUV. To some others, a truck. And the, and the list could go on and on there. So, universally, I gave to the church a vehicle or an automobile. But individually, I gave a truck, I gave a car, I gave a sedan, I gave a smart car, right? One of those little box car things riding around. Uh, it looks like you can just tip them over. But individually, I gave you something, and universally, I've given something. All right? So hold on to that analogy. Now, listen to this word individual. As it uh, has a little bit of an evolution here. But back in, when in, the, in the Greek word, it means peculiar. So if I give you an individual gift, it means that it's peculiar to anybody else's gift, right? So if I gave your car, uh, gave you a car, it's peculiar. Your truck is peculiar to her car, right? They're different. They're, they're, they're not the same. So this word here, I want to be careful here, because this word, when it was originally uh, Used, used, it was used of people who are peculiar, and then people would say, well, there, there's no one like him. The root word is idios. Okay? So, what the, the, the evolution of this word became idiot. Okay? And for someone to say that someone's an idiot, really, it was not a degrading thing early on, but it has become to say that they're an idiot, they're peculiar. Right? There's no one like him. There's no one like her. They're an idiot. All right? I want to tread lightly. Just follow this with me, okay? So it became the uh, use of people to say that there's no one like them. In the same way that we are given gifts individually, it's like saying that you and I are spiritual snowflakes. Right? Universally, we look out and say, it's snowing. There's, it's snowing, right? But individually, there's in each individual snowflake that each one is not like its individual. It's peculiar. There's, there's not another one like it. Each snowflake is not the same as any other snowflake. Okay? We've got to tread lightly with that word too these days, right? Snowflakes. But you're, what it means is you're the only one of your kind. You're peculiar. And while there are many Christians, there's many members, there's many Christians, they're each a bit unique. They're each a bit different. You can could, you could kind of say you're each a bit a spiritual idiot, right? All right? You're, you're peculiar. Okay, that, that was a joke. You know, I don't want to call you spiritual idiots, but just to kind of get you the idea of thinking that we're peculiar in our giftedness, okay? So now, we've got to understand this. I really want you to stay with me and put your thinking caps on here because I, I, think, I believe that this will glorify the Lord. I believe that you will be blessed once you hear this, okay? This is what Peter's trying to say to us, or Paul and Peter are trying to say to us. When you look further down in 1 Corinthians 12, and you look over into Romans chapter 12, you get more of a concise uh, list of the gifts that have been given to the local church and to, to the members of the body of Christ. When you look in uh, Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, you have the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, uh, the gift of miracles, uh, faith, prophecy, various kinds of tongues, interpretations. And then when you get over to Romans chapter 12, you have the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the gift of miracles, faith, prophecy, various kinds of different things. Uh, I'm sorry, gift of leadership, generous, and some of these different types of gifts. When you kind of tally them up, when you kind of get a, a list of them going on, you've got about 12 or so gifts that have been given that Peter, that uh, Paul mentions there. So the picture is this, that you have 12 gifts but you've got millions of Christians, right? So let's just kind of dedicate this side to the gifts. Hopefully I can keep this straight, okay? This side is, is the gifts that are given. You've got 12 or so gifts given to the local church, to, to the Christians. Then over here, you have, under the umbrella of Christianity, you have people who would call themselves true believers. But there are millions of people, right? Well, how in the world then do... These millions of Christians each get an individual gift. Because if you have 12, we would, if we were to assign those 12 gifts, 
we would run out before we get done with this side over here, then what would everybody else have? Well, we ran out of gifts, sorry. Okay? So how in the world do millions of Christians have a unique, peculiar, no one like him type gift if there's only 12 gifts? Okay? This is the question. Let's do this. Let's take the 12 gifts and let's use the color palette as a way to illustrate this, okay? Most of the time you have about three to six primary colors that people would say are primary colors. But by the time you get to the color wheel, you can look this up, by the time you get to the color wheel, you've got pretty much about 12 colors. And that's what I'm going to go with because we've got about 12 gifts, okay? So this analogy works pretty well. Uh, so we have 12 gifts or 12 colors, right? And we, and we want to give each member or each Christian a gift that is only unique to them, right? So follow this. So a study was done several years back, and they took one of the colors and mixed them with a, mixed that one color with a variety of all the other different colors. When they got done with that, they then multiplied that, the, all the possible different colors. So you take the color red, you have, uh, you have red, you got, you know, or white, off-white, you got, you know, all these different colors of white, or all these different colors of red. You get the idea? And then they would take the multiplication of how many different variations of that one color there are, multiply them back times the, the primary colors. And they got this number. I'm going to have to read it to you because I'm not sure I can pronounce it. 18 decillion different possibilities of colors. Okay? So I'm, I, I didn't know what a decillion was, so I looked it up. That's one with 33 zeros after it. That's the possibilities. That, that's the possibilities of different colors. Okay? So we took the 12 primary colors or the basic colors, and we said we took one of those out and multiply it by all the other possibilities of variations of color, then multiply that back times our 12, and came up with 18 decillion different colors. And if you go into a, a paint store like Lowe's, or you go into Sherwin-Williams, and they say, I'm thinking, about, um, I'm thinking about a blue. What's the next question? I mean, I'm looking at you, we've got a blue carpet, we've got blue shirts on, we've got millions of shades of blue. Which one are you talking about? Well, I'm thinking about a light blue. Well, then you go to the light blue section, and then they're still, you're beginning to narrow it down with the different light blues that they have. Well, I think about a greenish light blue. I think about a yellowish light blue. What in the world? There's so many different colors of just one individual color. Okay? All right. Now, apply the different possibilities of spiritual gifts there are just like we did. So if there's 12 gifts, and we take one gift out, like prayer, right? and we add in a combination of all the other gifts to prayer, you have 18 decillion types of gifts, right? So that, that shows us then how in the world can you have millions of Christians and not each one of them has the same gift. You are unique in your giftedness that comes from God. You are peculiar. No one has the same gift as you do. So this extent of this gift is then... It's, it's vast, it's wide, and you might have a variation of these 12 gifts, but no one has the exact same gift as you do, okay? No one has the exact same gift as I do. And then it, it, to, to kind of say, but wait, there's more, all right? Ephesians 4, 7 says this, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So whatever God has given you, whatever gift He's given you, He's also given it in a measure of grace. He's also given a measure of that gift. So to some, He's given more than He's given to others. And we can see this with the analogy, perhaps, let's take, let's take generosity as a gift. And we'll, we'll kind of say that generosity would kind of uh, be like the color green, right? For, for money, right? Kind of keep it straight in your mind. So if, if I say three of you in here have the, a, a form or variation of gift of generosity, that doesn't mean you're all equal in your generosity, right? Some of you might be really generous. Some of you might be moderately generous. And some of you might be somewhat generous, right? And so you might have that gift, but it's varied from each one. 
And that's what Ephesians 4 says, uh, 4 7 says to us. Uh, and you could go on down the list of all these different gifts and see how they've been given differently. You take teaching, for example. I I'm the pastor here at Cedar Mountain Baptist Church, and, and so I've been given a measure of some kind of gift that might involve teaching or preaching. I'm not sure, I hope so. But then you've got, you've got Billy Graham, right? Who's preaching to the masses, to the thousands? And you've got pastors and preachers and teachers anywhere in between that have been given a different measure of God's gift. So this is the extent of the gift. You can have any, you can have any combination of these gifts. You could, you could really look like a, a bouquet of flowers, right? Kind of to, to puff you up a little bit. You're gorgeous with your gifts, right? You look good with all your gifts. You've got mercy, you've got gentleness, you've got kindness, you've got prayer, right? You, you're, you're showing humility, you're generous, and all the, and they're kind of putting this bouquet. It's like, man, you, you're, you're a good-looking believer, okay? You're a bouquet of flowers. Mercy, grace, you've got hospitality in that gift, in that bouquet. And all these gifts are given by the Spirit in order that we might serve God fully and completely. Remember, no one is exactly like you. So when you pick up your bouquet of flowers, and you're looking at, there's, no one else has that same bouquet of flowers. That, that's unique and peculiar to you, spiritual snowflake, all right? I want spiritual snowflake says spiritual idiot. You saw that, right? Okay. So no one is exactly like you. You're, you're, you are unique to the kingdom of God. And then you add in your, your spiritual cap or your physical capabilities, which you're able to do, the training that you receive, the background, your opportunity, your experiences, and you become your, this, you function like no one else. You're this bouquet arrangement of, of spiritual gifts that functions like no one else in, in the body of Christ. And so you are very valuable. You're very important to the body of Christ. So this is the extent of the gift given, okay? Now, the rest of these few points, we're not going to spend as much time on, but I want you to hear these, okay? The source of the gift, number two. The source of the gift, or where does the gift come from, we want to ask. Well, verse 10 tells us this also. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So you received the gift. Someone gave it to you. You didn't earn it. You didn't go out and petition for it. You didn't work up to it. You didn't generate your gift. You simply received the gift from God. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 12 for just a moment. This gift is given with grace, and it's God who gives you this gift. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4. I want you to see this here. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit... Notice we're talking about here the same spirit, and then there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God. Within this, this, this sentence or this phrase, we see the triune Godhead, don't we? We see the triune Godhead. This is the Trinity who, it's God who gives the gift by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the by, uh, by way of the Lord, the same Lord, the service is by the Lord, and it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So we see here that it is God is the source of the gift. And then verse uh, 11 of chapter 12, how does he give them? All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills, or as he desires to give them, or as he chooses. So we receive a gift from God and He has given it for His purposes as He desires and this extent is that it, it, it's vast, it's wonderful it's, it's a collage of things then notice the third thing I want you to see here is the nature of the gift and we touched on this already but the word we're talking about gift comes from the word charisma and it's a word that means really freely given on account or favor in kindness it's freely given. So the, the, the nature of the gift is that God has freely given this to believers, to the body of Christ. God has given this to, to us. It's undeserved. It's unearned. It's completely free. It's given to us by God's Holy Spirit. So what is the nature of our gift? It's motivated, motivated by the grace of God, given sovereignly by God, freely to 
every believer at the moment of conversion. When you pray and ask the Lord Jesus Christ and you surrender your life to Him, you have received then a gift freely undeserved. So we could really say it in a sentence to kind of get our minds wrapped around this thing like this. What is a spiritual gift? It is a gift given freely by God in His grace to all believers, which the Holy Spirit uses to minister to the body of Christ. I'll read that one more time. What is a spiritual gift? It is a gift given freely by God in His grace to all believers, which the Holy Spirit uses to minister to the body of Christ. So take, Peter takes care of the vertical in the vertical relationship in a personal holiness. He takes care of the horizontal relationship in that we are to love one another. And that's really what the Bible is about. If you forget all the other commandments, love God and love others, right? So Peter takes care of that. But then he goes, he calls us to serve one another with the tools in which he gave us, right? So the service is, listen, the service is this. We're not just to go out and figure how we are to serve one another on our own. We use it by the tools that are in our tool bag, and that's the spiritual gift which God has given to us. And what's in your tool bag might have some of the same elements that's in mine, but it's not exactly like mine. Your tool bag is what your gift is uniquely uh, peculiar to you and uniquely peculiar to me. Now we can ask the question, why does he give us the gift? Why does he give us this gift? And this is fourth, the obligation. The obligation. Verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says it this way. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So Peter says, use it to serve one another. Paul says, use it for the common good. Of who or what? The church, the believers, we are to be using our gifts to, for the benefit of the church, to help the church, to help the believers in the local church. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that the way in which the human body functions is the way the body of Christ functions. We're to help each other out. Listen, you're not to desire, furthermore, you're not to desire a gift that somebody else has. And so if you're a liver or if you're a kidney, you're inside the body. If you're a gallbladder, who wants to be a gallbladder? If you're a gallbladder inside the body, you're looking at the outside of the body and think, man, I want to be a hand. I want to be practical. I want to be functional. I want to be eyes. I want to be ears. Something that can really help out the body. I want to, I want to really make a difference. Listen, you just take away the liver, the kidney, and the gallbladder and see where the body gets you. Where does that get the body? Nowhere, right? We need every part of the body to function just like in the body of Christ. Everybody's valuable. Everybody's important. Not everybody gets to be our finger or hand or not. I don't even know what that would be when we think about the, the outward uh, approach for Christ. But we can all be the hands and feet of Jesus by doing whatever function that God has called us to be. So we're going to talk about that in just a second as we close. But I want you to think about this. Go back to our example for just a moment. If we, show up, if we show up for a men's work day here at the church, right? And everybody has brought their tools this time, right? They've got the chainsaw, the axes, the go the, the the splitters, and everything they need to cut firewood. And then someone drives down the road, and they pull in and say, what in the world are you guys doing? We don't necessarily say this. We're being the hands and feet of Jesus. We're using our spiritual gifts to function as the body of believers for the common good, for the, for the sake of Jesus Christ, for other believers. We don't necessarily go into all that, but we just say, we're loving on our brother. We're loving on our sister. We're loving on, we're doing what God's called us to do. We're splitting fire with brother. Why are you doing it? Because that's what we're called to do. Because we have gifts, we have talents. And, and my gift or talent may look a little bit different than yours, but we come together for the purpose of serving one another. So it says, don't desire to be like anybody else, right? You do, you do what God has called you to do. You exercise that gift, and you function in that gift because it's important. What if, what if uh, for the sake of an analogy or an illustration here, what if somebody has the gift of, of a, a wonderful, godly prayer time in a prayer closet where no one can see it, and they say, you know what, I'm not going to use that gift. And then we, as the church, are relying on people praying for one another, Right? There's a group that meets up here on Monday night that is in their own little prayer closet, right? And, and they're the backbone of the church, praying for Cedar Mountain Baptist Church, week in and week out, faithful, consistent prayer time. What if they just say, you know what, I don't want that gift, I want somebody else's gift. 
I want to get, I want a, uh, a different gift, and I'm going to go find that other gift. I'm going to go search for a different gift so that I can look more important, that I can look like something that I, I'm not, and all this kind of thing. Then that it cripples the body of Christ, doesn't it? It cripples them, but then it cripples the body of Christ because now nobody's praying, and we need the prayer. So he's saying, your gift is important because God is the one that's given it to you. He's perfectly freely, sovereignly bestowed this gift that's on you that He has given it to you. And you are to use it, you are obliged to use it to bless, to encourage, and to strengthen like nobody else can. So don't become envious of anybody else's gifts. Use the gifts that God has given uh, you to use. So if we're going to effectively communicate who Christ is to a lost and dying world, we must use our gift. To the to within the congregation, so the outside world looks back at us and say, "That's what it's all about, right there." Why are they doing this? I don't understand why you would go and pressure wash somebody's house. I don't understand why you would show up to somebody and not even clean their house for them. Why are you doing? Why would you go to someone's house and sing and pray with them on their front yard, right? Like we did for Tom and Vivian, and, and to, to kind of let you know, the neighbors are like, "What's going on? What are you doing?" You know, Tom actually had to kind of call the neighbors and let them know, hey, I didn't die, okay? They're not showing up, right? They're coming because they love us. They're coming to pray for us. They're coming to sing, to fellowship with us. And they begin to ask questions to themselves. What in the world was that? Of? We don't have anybody come to sing and pray and fellowship with us, right? So they begin to ask, what's different about you? And, and the, the ability to share Christ's love and tell them because they love Christ, they want to, and because they love others, they want to use their spiritual gifts to serve others. Alright, so in closing, let's pick up verse 11. I want you to see this. This is very powerful and very, very important. As we close this section out in this suffering with heaven in view, I want you to see this. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles, or your translation may say utterances, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here's what Peter's saying in closing this little brief little section out. The gifts that we receive can really be boiled down into, into two categories. Number one, speaking gifts. And, the, and secondly, serving gifts. Some of us have been given a gift which involves speaking, preaching, teaching, Given words of wisdom or discernment or knowledge, leadership perhaps. And some have been given the gifts of serving, gifts of service, the gift of administration, the gift of prayer, which we've talked about as kind of a, a quiet, a silent, behind the scenes type thing. Showing mercy, the gifts of help. These are other types of gifts of serving. So if your gift involves, involves speaking, here's what Peter's saying. There's a condition, there's a clause. All right? And here it is. When you speak, you speak the truth about God. You speak clearly about who God is. You don't speak your own thoughts. You don't speak your own ideas about who God is. God has written a book. He tells us who He is. We don't need to dream up anything about God and preach that. We don't have fuzzy feelings and then preach about God. We don't speak on God's behalf after eating Mexican food the night before, right? God's Word is full of truth about who He is. We don't need to think that up or dream that up. It's very clearly written for us. So that's what He means by whoever speaks as one who speaks or, uh, oracles or utterances of God. When you speak about God, those of you who have speaking gifts, speak the truth about God. And I would go further to say, when you're listening to preaching and teaching, I, I know that this is not your only source of spiritual growth in here on Sunday morning. You're at home listening to other sermons. You're, you're cruising the internet looking at other preachers, and I, I'm thankful for that. But listen, if they must be speaking the truth about who God is. Or turn them off. Run from them. There's plenty of churches, there's plenty of pulpits, even in western North Carolina this morning, who are not speaking the truth about God. They're speaking their own ideas. They're, they're, they're talking about political things. We've got much more important things than political things. Spiritual things, godly things, biblical things. But then if your in, uh, gift involves serving, notice what he says to do here. And one who serves by the strength that God supplies. 
So if your gift is an act of service in some way, some bouquet of serving, here's how you do it. Through the strength that only God supplies. In other words, you don't do it by your own strength. You don't do it by your own might. You don't do it by your own power. You're to serve God with what He supplies and how He supplies it. If you have the gifts of helps or a gift of, of the area of administration, you do that with God's help. If you have the gift of giving or the gift of prayer, you do that by God's power and God's strength. And it's better to do that by God's strength than by our, our own. When we do it with our own strength, we fall flat on our face and we say, we can't lift the bar. We can't get the job. We can't accomplish the task because we're not doing it in God's strength in which He supplies. So Peter gives us full instructions on spiritual gifts here. The extent, everybody's got them. Every Christian has them. But individually, they are unique. The source of these gifts is that they come from God. They can't be sought. They can't be bought. They can't be earned. They are given by grace as a free gift from God's sovereignty. The nature of the gifts is that there are its spiritual enablements through which the Spirit uses to minister to the body. The obligation, you are to use your gift. I am to use my gift. And you are, and I are to use them as one who has a stewardship before God as He, as we want to, as He gives them to us. We are to use them back to God. So that's the, that's the, the instructions, right? But I kind of want to go back to the, the bigger outline here. And just by way of closing, the incentive, Christ's return is at hand. It's close. It's near. The instructions, live with personal holiness, love others well, and because you love them and love God, you serve them well. Acts of service. And then thirdly this morning, the intention. What is the goal in all of this? And this is very short as we close. The intention is this. Verse 11. In order that in everything... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's how He says it. Amen. What is the intention of our holiness? What is the intention of our love for one another? What is the intention of our service? Peter says it right here. That God may be what? Glorified. Glorified. That God may be glorified so that in all things, all matters, all Christian duty, all service, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. This is, by the way, we call what we call a doxology. Uh, Troy, would you mind getting the doxology ready? I'd like to sing that. I failed to mention that to you this morning. But in just a few moments, uh, at the close, I'd like for us to sing the doxology. We can sing that a cappella. But I'd like, to hear you, I'd like to, for us to lift our voices. And really what a doxology means is this. One who glorifies God. It's a praise about uh, uh, God. It's giving glory back to God. Doxa meaning glory. It's, it's the glory of God. And that's what this text has called us to do. Is to glorify God in our personal holiness, in our love for one another, in our service for one another. Listen, it's not so that people will turn inward and say, look what they have done. We, if they do that, we reflect that back in doxology, in praise, in glory, in admiration to Almighty God. So where we can look at people and say, listen, I didn't come bust your firewood. I didn't come split your fire. I didn't come paint your house. I didn't do these things so that you would give me glory and give me praise. I did these things because I used my gift to serve you because this is giving glory and honor to Almighty God. So we suffer... And we live with heaven in view, with Christ's imminent return, using our gifts to love and encourage others with the intent of glorifying Him. And then notice that last word, amen. That's, that's an exclamation point right there, right? It's amen. And what Peter's saying is, let, let it be. Let it be. And so we say with Peter, and let these things be. I hope that you will commit, and that I will commit to live a life of personal holiness before God, but then also love others well. Not just the church, but strangers. But then also that we would serve each other well. Let's stand and bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Holy Father, as we conclude this service today, Lord, we just think about how good you are to us, that you have called us to do a job, that we are to represent the kingdom of God, that we are to represent Christ. And Lord, you've given us the tools and the resources in which we are to do that. And Lord, you've given us all a gift, but individually you've given us a unique gift in which we are to accomplish these goals. 
So Lord, as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would help us by giving us opportunities to serve and love each other well. But Lord, even a step before that, Lord, we ask that you would help us to uh, live a life of personal holiness, where we still commune with you, where we fellowship with you, before we start our day, before we meet with others. And Lord, we pray that you would get the glory, that you would receive glory, that you would help others to see the good work that you started in us, so that we can tell them about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you came to save a lost and dying world. Lord, we pray that we would be bold, that we would stand up for the cause of Christ, especially during these times. So, Lord, if we, we would like to uh, give you thanks for that this morning, but also, Lord, during this time of invitation and reflection, Lord, we just ask that uh, you would work in our hearts. And, Lord, if we haven't got this settled, that we would do that today. So, we ask, God, that you would have your time and work in our hearts during this time of invitation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.